It is our honor and privilege to welcome each and every one of you on behalf of the President and the Council of the College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka to witness the ceremonial induction of the President of the College and the inauguration ceremony of the 29th Annual Scientific Sessions. We are pleased to announce that today's program is broadcasted live via YouTube and we welcome all of you joining us virtually. Ladies and gentlemen, to begin today's proceedings, we have the lighting of the lamp of learning, which aptly symbolizes dispelling of darkness, of ignorance, with the light of knowledge. To do the honors, may I cordially invite the following dignitaries. Our chief guest today, Professor Mohan De Silva, Emeritus Professor of Surgery, University of Sri Jayawardenepura. The guest of honor, Dr. Alaka Singh, WHO country representative to Sri Lanka. The keynote speaker for today, Dr. P. Nandalal Veera Singh, Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Dr. Asay Lagunavardana, the President of the College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka. Dr. R. M. S. K. Ratnayaka, outgoing president of the College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka. Dr. Alan Ludwig, secretary to the college. Dr. G. B. J. Surya, treasurer of the college. Dr. Lucian Jai Surya, representing past presidents of the college. Gentlemen, please remain standing for the national anthem.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Let me now invite the following dignitaries to, the, to take their seats at the head table. Professor Mohan De Silva, Emeritus Professor of Surgery, University of Sri Jayawardenepura. Dr. Aleka Singh, WHO Country Representative to Sri Lanka. Dr. P. Nandalal Veerasinghe, Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Dr. Asela Gunawardana, President of the College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka. Dr. R. M. S. K. Ratnayaka, outgoing president of the college. Dr. Alan Ludwig, secretary of the college. Dr. G. Vijay Surya, treasurer of the college. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now our pleasure to call upon Dr. R. M. S. K. Ratnayaka, the outgoing president of the College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka, to welcome this distinguished gathering with the opening remarks and elaborate in the college activities of the year 2021. Over to you, sir. Very good evening. The chief guests for today, Professor Mohandi Silva, Emerit Professor of Surgery, the guest of honor, Dr. Alka Singh, WHO representative of Sri Lanka, the keynote speaker for today, Dr. Nandala P. Virasinghe, governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Dr. Asela Gunwardana, the President of College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka, past presidents, council members, and members of College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka, my dear colleague, and ladies and gentlemen. As going president of the college, it is my duty as well as a privilege to welcome you all to the induction of the President and inauguration of 29th scientific session of College of Medical Administration of Sri Lanka. The College of Medical Administration of Sri Lanka is professional body for the medical administrators of Sri Lanka. In 1974, the Association of Medical Administrators was formed mainly to look after interests of government medical administrators. This association was foundation that paved the way of establishment of College of Medical Administration of Sri Lanka in 1992 by a group of 43 medical administrators. Scientific sessions are the most important event our annual calendar. First of all, it is my privilege to welcome Chief guest today, uh, event, Professor Mohan De Silva, Emerit Professor in Surgery and Chairman of the University Grant Commission. Despite your extremely busy schedule, you have accepted our invitation without any hesitation. On behalf of the Council and the College, I would like to welcome you to the induction of President and 29th annual scientific session. I would like to welcome the guest of honor, Dr. Alkas Singh, WHO country representative of the Sri Lanka, 
who accepted our invitation despite your other commitment and has graced this occasion. Dr. Alka Singh has been a great strength to Sri Lankan Health Services. I would like to remember the unconditional support she provided us during the COVID pandemic and even the recent, the current economic crisis. The keynote address of scientific session is always one of the highlight of the day. The council unanimously decided to invite Dr. Nandalal P. Virasinghe, the governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, as a keynote speaker for today. I warmly welcome Dr. Nandalal P. Virasinghe, who accepted our humble invitation, and we are eagerly looking forward to hearing from you. I have no doubt you will have enough and more questions even after the session from our medical administrators. I would like to welcome my dear colleague, the President, College of Medical Administrator, Dr. Asela Gunwardana, Director General of Health Services, and all his council and mem members of uh, members. It is my duty to welcome representatives of other respective colleges and special invitees for the inauguration ceremony. I think this, uh, I take this opportunity to welcome past president, past council members, and members of colleges administrators of Sri Lanka for the induction and inauguration ceremony of 29th scientific session. Ministry of Health has established vision as a healthier nation for the con that contribute to the economic, social, mental and spiritual development. We medical administrators are responsible for making the vision in, in a ground reality. We are the leaders who march the entire health sector toward the common goal of healthier nation. Good health is a backbone of development of country and we have very clearly witnessed that during the recent COVID pandemic, Every government spent significant portion of national budget on health sector to in improve their, its people. The prosperity of nation depends on its health of the nation. The, our health system is very complex and complicated. We not only, the, not only have achieved our national goal, as well as the global health challenges, but also need to solve complicated day-to-day -day trade union issues, administrative matters, and never-ending financial issues. Only the rough sea have made strong sailor. Only the challengers have made better administrators. Last two years, we had a COVID pandemic. Now we are facing the worst economic crisis after independence. These external challenges have created enough envir environment for, tough environment for medical administrators. But I believe these challenges will create our paternity better and more creative and more effective. Whatever economic situation of the country, we cannot let our patient down. We cannot let patient die due to lack of resources. We have to end uh, have a unimaginable challenges to overcome. I have utmost belief that the guest of the speaker today, the governor of the central bank and his department will help medical administrator to sail the safely uh, during the, this hurricane. The present situation of the healthcare institution has been examined under the microscope by media and social media around the clock. Unfortunately, we need to import more than 80% of pharma and also nearly 100% surgical and other consumable. So, a lot of people, including officials of Treasury, as well as some other policy makers, believe that health has already given enough more funds to import medical supplies. Therefore, there shouldn't be any problem, but unfortunately our condition is not so. 
all the funds we have received have come through a funding line like Indian Credit Line, AIIB, ADB, etc. The complex administrative and sometimes unique procurement related conditions create significant delays to import medical supplies. Importing medical supply has own hardship as well. These need to have a quality assurance certificate, NMRA approval. Then some manufacturers began to their production only when the LCs are open. Sometimes do not have multiple suppliers. We have only single supplier. Therefore, importing good quality medical supplies to the Sri Lanka is more complicated than the importing dal or onion, potatoes or even vehicles. All the problems that are uh, in the supply chain, medical supply is an issue. If something, if some, something catastrophic happened due to the lack of medical supplies, at in the, the, there will be a million times worse than anything that happened during, during the fuel shortage. We as a ministry uh, have tried our level best to reduce lead time to eight weeks. But for the next eight weeks, it's very crucial. We have no way to supply our demand unless we get our own money to purchase medical supply. Now, of course, we are dependent on credit line. This is a significant risk for con condition of our health sector. May get worse because inevitable problems. I believe our keynote speaker, Dr. Nandalal P. Pirasinghe, the governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, could help us to find required fund to import most required medical supply for the next eight weeks to prevent the pending catastrophe. After that, we can expect to receive the medical supply through the credit line uh, we have already finalized the work and in the process. Our other problem that we all have is auditors. But we want auditors, but easily forget the present condition. When things better, our medical administrators have done remarkable job during the COVID pandemic, contain the pandemic, and treating the patient as well as the and ensuring safety of patient as well as members. But now auditors cannot not even remember that there was a pandemic and goes behind the people who did extraordinary work to contain the pandemic. Our medical administrators have capable capability to perform exceptional level during the economic crisis, but they have been discouraged due to the anticipated audit queries. I think this is another issue our college face and need to be solved together. In order to achieve our goal, we believe we need to empower medical administrators to make stronger, weaponize them with the modern knowledge and skill and attitude. We understand, understood the shortcoming management issues related to the medical supply chain the Ministry of Health has decided to digitalize the medical supply information management already in the process of implementing SWASTA, comprehensive information management system for the managing medical supply. I believe all the supports we can establish a system that will allow us to take data driven evidence based decision. Our strategic planning the effective decision making, ex exemplary leadership will be the key stone of the healthier nation. During this tough time, the College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka has clearly identified challenge, has made it our key responsibility to develop skill for the challenge, face the challenge, challenges. Therefore, last year, vision declared was leaders in 21st century grooming the next generation of competent healthcare leaders. 
our go our goal was to strengthen four pillars professional development skill development financial independence and social welfare safeguarding dignity and medical administrators last year we had unique challenge of covid covid pandemic despite that we have managed to continue our activities to achieve our goal i would like to mention few of such uh, uh important activities we as a college of medical admin sri lanka initiated several important online hybrid courses for the development of our members based on the covid pandemic we had program on bio bubble concept covid vaccination institutional preparation of bed fasts against covid the strategic planning for covid and we also successfully organized workshop on designing design thinking tool for efficient public service passion to perform and lead the way a special tailor made continuous leadership program for by the be brown lanka for this program we conducted disciplinary procedure the assess management and financial management as well as e court the office management we highly were uh, highly appreciated by members hand on training novel technology like gis mapping etc believe to be have been beneficial for our colleges colleagues to upgrade their their self highly successful academic session launch our new website and performing this is you into intervention to safeguard field of medical admins have also been important services to implement during the last year our new president my dear friend dr asela gunawardana director general of health service and his council has updated our vision of developing highly competent medical administrators to face challenges in 21st century to strategic healthcare leadership then navigating through a troubles water so let us all rally round under the flag of sri lankan college of medical administrators to develop highly competent medical administrators let us overcome the challenges of 21st century let us make healthier nation let us create the develop laureat nation in the future generation once again i would like to uh, thank for you giving me the opportunity thank you hope you will have a wonderful evening today thank you thank you sir ladies and gentlemen we now move on to a very important segment of today's proceedings the ceremonial induction of the president of the college of medical administrators of sri lanka first we would like to invite dr alan ludwig Sec secretary to the college to read out the citation of dr asela priyanta gunawardana president of the college of medical administrators of sri lanka Dr Asela Priyanta Gunawardana was born in 1965 in Badulla and he completed his primary education at Badulla Uva College and secondary education at Badulla Central College he excelled academically while also showing an interest interest in sports such as hockey and cricket he entered the university of peradeniya in 1984 as a medical student balancing his medical studies with extracurricular activities and his performance in the university hockey team is testimony to this he started his medical career as a district medical officer at badal kumbura in 1994 followed by service in several health institutions in which he served as a district medical officer medical officer maternal and child health regional malaria officer regional director of health services and finally as a director of a teach of the colombo south teaching hospital he completed a masters degree and a doctorate in medical administration and also pursued a masters degrees in buddhist studies and business administration
He has received both local and international training in numerous fields. Dr. Asele is currently reading for a PhD in Buddhist studies. He has been actively developing health systems and institutions using his vast experience, skills, and training. He is one of the outstanding medical administrators who is keen on developing quality patient care services, productivity improvement, and system simplification and development. He has won several national and international productivity awards. Dr. Asele is the most senior medical administrator who has experience in both preventive and curative health sectors. Well equipped with extensive knowledge of the health sector since his career began at the grassroots levels where he developed the required skills, he now holds the most prestigious and powerful position as the Director General of Health Services of the Ministry of Health. Dr. Asele Gunawardana is a beloved husband of Sagarika and a loving father of Shakya and Kovida. We would like to invite the outgoing president of the college, Dr. R. M. S. K. Ratnayaka, to formally induct the president of the college, Dr. Asele Gunawardana, by presenting the President's Medal. Dr. Asela Gunwardana, the president of the college, will now present the outgoing president's medal to Dr. R. M. S. K. Ratnayaka. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, Next on the agenda is the address by our guest of honor, Dr. Alaka Singh, WHO country representative to Sri Lanka. I would now like to invite Dr. Alan Ludwig, secretary of the college to read out the citation of Dr. Alaka Singh, WHO country representative to Sri Lanka. Dr. Alaka Singh assumed the responsibilities of WHO representative to Sri Lanka from the 14th of May, 2021. An Indian national, Dr. Alaka Singh, has worked in health and development for over two decades. With WHO, she has held positions in all three levels of the organization, supporting countries in the Southeast Asian, as well as the African and Eastern Mediterranean regions. Her technical experience has been focused on health systems, primary health care, and universal health coverage. She has led on several key WHO efforts in these areas, including development of the Regional Strategy on Universal Health Coverage, 2012 to 2017, and more recently, on a regional agenda to advance PhD post-COVID. Alaka, Dr. Alaka Singh has also worked with the Office of the Director Gen General, Dr. Margaret Chang, at the WHO headquarters, assisting with high-level discussions between the DG and member states. And as Deputy WHO Representative to Myanmar, where she participated in the UN response to both the transition to democracy as well as the humanitarian emergency. Prior to joining WHO, Dr. Alaka Singh worked for the World Bank in the New Delhi and Washington offices with the Health, Nutrition and Population Cluster, participating in some of the first lending programs for health systems in India. Dr. Alaka Singh has organized several international conferences, served on academic panels, and been a referee for international journals. Her latest journal contribution was as a co-editor of the February 2021 issue of the Southeast Asian Journal of Public Health that captures lessons learned from the pandemic for strengthening PHC for UHC in the region. Dr. Alaka Singh has an educational background in economics and development with a first degree from the, uh, from the Delhi University and advanced degrees from the College of William and Mary, Virginia, USA and Cambridge University, UK. I have the pleasure of inviting Dr. Alaka Singh to the podium.
Thank you, Dr. Allen. Good evening. Chief guests, Dr. Mohanda Silva, the keynote speaker, Dr. Veera Singha, the incoming president, Director General of Health Services, the outgoing president, senior officials of the Ministry of Health, council and members of the College of the Med Medical Administrators and participants. It's a great privilege for me to be here today on behalf of WHO at the induction of the president and inauguration of the 29th annual scientific sessions of the College of Medical Administrators. My congratulations to the outgoing president for all the achievements last year and to the incoming president, WHO commits to work with you very closely in the next year. My congratulations also to the college for organizing this event and providing a platform to discuss strategic healthcare leadership navigating through troubled waters. Indeed, we are in troubled waters. This is an extremely timely discussion as Sri Lanka looks to, to explore innovative ways to steer through the dual crisis of a prolonged pandemic and we cannot forget that the pandemic is not yet over, as well as an unprecedented economic crisis. The theme put forward by the academic sessions is aligned very well with what WHO is doing as one WHO to support Sri Lanka, from headquarters, from the regional office, and of course, the country office here in Colombo. Leadership for WHO is a key governance function. It involves formulating of a vision and strategic policies, strategies and plans to improve the population's health and well-being. Leading a whole of government and whole of society approach to health, because health is everybody's business and we need health in all policies with the collaboration of all areas and sectors to achieve the health goals, including working with the private sector and communities and the oversight of implementation and monitoring evaluation for both tracking progress towards our goals as well as evidence-based review of the policy strategies and plans. With a rapidly evolving situation, the health context today is very complex. There are multiple influences beyond traditional influences on health, the demographic and epi changes. We now have the influence of economic crisis, of conflict, of unplanned urbanization, globalization, commercialization, natural disasters, and climate change, as well as social activism, especially in seeking more responsive governance and leadership. This requires adapting and transforming leadership. WHO is urging all member states to broaden the perspective on leadership in medical administration towards strategic leadership of health more broadly. Sri Lanka for WHO and indeed uh, other countries has been acknowledged as a star in terms of health. The country has performed consistently well on basic health indica indicators especially when, when we observe other countries in the same income group. This has been sustained over a number of years. In fact, primary healthcare in Sri Lanka predates WHO's push um, in terms of the Alma Ata Declaration in 1976. Sri Lanka was one of the models used for that declaration. More importantly, Sri Lanka has done this at relatively low levels of income. The evidence is really unequivocal, both on health outcomes as well as, importantly today, on social protection, particularly access to affordable services for all. COVID-19 has changed public health forever. But even before COVID, Sri Lanka was already looking ahead to the challenge of NCDs and tackling this through the primary health care system. COVID-19 challenged not just the health system, but also the global economy. For Sri Lanka, superimposed on this is an unprecedented country-specific economic crisis. And I'm sure we'll hear more about this and the implications um, from the next speakers. 
in the prevailing global context, the global economic context, recovery will be slow and prolonged at best. This is a very difficult time to recover from an economic crisis. In partnership with Ministry of Health and with inputs from the UN and the IFIs, the World Bank and ADB, WHO is helping to move forward in health in this very difficult context by documented, documenting lessons learned from COVID, including from Sri Lanka, as well as other countries that have safeguarded health successfully during economic crisis. There are some preliminary indications as to what directions will be required towards strategic leadership to charter policy directions and develop, develop strategic plans to na navigate troubled waters and sustain Sri Lanka's outstanding achievements in health thus far and make for the further progress on national goals as well as the SDGs. Please allow me to highlight some of these, and I see that we'll be discussing in more detail in the days to come. But critically here, in the current context, is that we must continue to emphasize that public investment in public health in Sri Lanka is the most successful social protection effort in the country. The results are very clear, both in terms of a health outcome as well as financial risk protection. Going forward, we are conscious and we do acknowledge that additional revenues to be allocated to health may be constrained. We certainly continue to advocate for more money for health, but we also need to look inwards and get, try and get more health for the money. The principle here being more efficient in what it is that we are doing. So we continue to do what we are doing, but try to do it better and more efficiently. And that is, we look at our interventions. How do we allocate? What is it that we are doing? and improve allocative efficiency and also distribution efficiency for who is it that we are doing and technical efficiency, that is, how are we doing what we are doing. Um, I'll just quote from our experience in supporting countries using health intervention and technology assessments. This is quite a useful tool for the kind of evidence-based decision-making that we were talking about earlier. So really looking, focusing on efficiency and using tools and techniques to inform decision-making between choices. Sri Lanka's primary healthcare approach has thus far been based on a programmatic approach. We have well-established programs led by experts and specialists. The experience in improving primary healthcare in the context of economic crisis is using a cross-cutting platform like health systems to improve cross-cutting programmatic efficiencies. We have done a, a study in Sri Lanka and have found that there are significant inefficiencies. For example, there is overuse of diagnostics. There is, that where there is the potential to promote cross-programmatic efficiencies, including, for example, in the use of laboratories. This is one area in terms of improving service delivery that we need to look very carefully at. And the incentive structure in the health system to reinforce the already, in, uh, uh, the reforms already being implemented in the form of the shared care cluster approach. This approach tries to improve efficiency across the health system, strengthening the primary level and then higher levels of care through functional referrals. And of course, we need to match this with the health workforce. And we've been facing the issue of migration of health workforce. We need to look very carefully at the labor market's implications of the economic crisis for health specifically. We also need to look at the mix of the cadres that we need if we are going to promote a primary healthcare system that is really focused at the primary level and at prevention and primary prevention. When we compare Sri Lanka to other countries in the region, for example, if we look at Thailand, 
we see that the ratio of doctors to nurses and midwives in Thailand is about four, one to four. In Sri Lanka, it's closer to two. So maybe we also need to look at the way we are producing, allocating our health workforce. Medicines, and we have since March this year, we have looked at medicines in terms of severe stockouts, severe shortages, and clearly this is an issue that needs to be looked at very carefully. Sri Lanka already has made significant pro progress on this. We have several agencies and institutions that are working together to try and bring um, uh, the, supply, the entire supply chain management from procurement to pricing to distribution. But we perhaps need to relook at this um, in the current context. Sri Lanka's medicines bill is quite significant. And there are ways WHO, uh, WHO's work globally in terms of identifying key inefficiencies across different countries in health systems has identified medicines as the key area of inefficiencies. We do need to look at poten the potential, the possibility of changing prescribing practices and the incentives to actually uh, prescribe generics. In one study in Thailand, a single hospital, the effect of introducing inpatient mandatory generic drug substitution resulted in a savings of $10 million a year. Of course, we need to balance it with a decline in the profits of the hospital, but that was only 1.7 million. There are ways to balance this, and there is international experience available. Sri Lanka's primary healthcare system is so strong that we have the potential, as we did during COVID, for example, in the healthcare management uh, initiative, we can respond very quickly to a crisis, and we can change course as well. Um, there are other requirements for affordable medicines, particularly regulation with credible enforcement, including transparency, a key function of broader governance, including leadership and oversight. Separating prescribing and dispensing and purchasing based on the assessment of all alternatives available. Again, Thailand has used health technology assessments very effectively to bring down global prices. They're able to negotiate with international suppliers to bring down prices using health technology assessment. Most importantly, perhaps it's time to reset the way health is financed in Sri Lanka. Before COVID, 50% of Sri Lanka's health expenditure was out of pocket. Sri Lanka is very unique here too. It's one of the very few countries where out-of-pocket spending is not regressive. It's coming from the higher income groups. It's not impacting the poor. In a region where impoverishment due to healthcare cost is highest, it, it accounts for one-third of annual poverty in the broader region. Sri Lanka is an outlier here. But when we look again at what other countries have done during a crisis, um, again, I will compare with Thailand, which was a lower income country when it achieved universal health coverage. It was devoting similar amount as a proportion of GDP as Sri Lanka was, 3.6. 70% was coming from government funding. Only 10% was out of pocket. This is one of the basic principles of social protection going forward for Sri Lanka. We really need to look at how we can pool the 50% that is coming out of pocket more effectively. Can we create a single pool where we can, that we can use and administer and channel effectively from the rich, from the healthy, from the young, to the poor, to those who need help in terms of healthcare and the elderly? And if we pool resources, we're better able to negotiate prices, whether it's, with, whether it's the case of medicines, whether it's the case of private providers. If we go as individual patients to the private sector, 
we are not able to negotiate the cost. But if we pool resources and we come together, we are better able to negotiate. It keeps the cost down in the health system. Of course, all these changes we must acknowledge will require increased investment. They will require in in increased investment, not just in funding, but also the creation of institutes and capacities. But given the experience in other countries, similar situations in Sri Lanka, these are some of the directions that we would require the leadership to explore and examine and look at the relevance in the Sri Lanka context. The potential of IT is huge, not just in terms of data to inform decision making, monitoring and evaluation, but we've also seen during COVID in terms of support, actual support to services. Again, a huge area to look at as we go forward. From WHO, again, we are available um, to help as best we can to put together, to document some of the experiences, to learn lessons learned and best practices, to help assess how they would work in Sri Lanka going forward. Again, we reiterate um, to the central bank among our own partners to the IMF and the World Bank that Sri Lanka's health system is one of the shining examples of social protection in a relatively low income setting. It's been an example for other countries and I'm sure it will be an example for other countries getting out of the economic crisis. But it really is time to rethink what we've been doing so far and reset some of our critical health systems functions in the country. From WHO, we look forward to the proceedings of the conference, and of course, we remain, as always, ready to help in any way we can going forward. Thank you very much again for inviting us. Thank you for your informative and inspirational thoughts, ma'am. And I would like to invite the president of the college to present a token of appreciation to our guest of honor, Dr. Alaka Singh. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is time now for the address by our chief guest tonight, Professor Mohan De Silva, Emeritus Professor of Surgery, University of Sri Jayawardenepura. I would now like to invite Dr. Asela Gunwardena, the president of the college, to read out the citation of our chief guest. Professor Mohan De Silva is a senior consultant surgeon and Emirates Professor of Surgery at the University of Jayawardenepura. He graduated from Faculty of Medicine, Kalamu with honors and underwent postgraduate surgical training in UK. He is a fellow of Royal College of Surgeons, Edinburgh and holds Masters of Surgery of the Postgraduate Institute of Colombo. He retired from the university system as a senior professor of surgery and chair at the Faculty of Medical Sciences, where he also serves as a dean of the faculty. He was conferred the professor of emeritus of surgery on retirement. He was a past president of College of Surgeons, Sri Lanka, a former honorary consultant, general surgeon, middle chair, hospital NHS Foundation Trust, UK and was a consultant surgeon at Columbus South Teaching Hospital from 1998 to 2018. Professor Mohan De Silva is a fellow of the Asian Specific Society of Digestive Endoscopy and was the WHO expert advisor on patient safety member states, Sierra New Delhi, a former member of the governing council of South Asian University New Delhi and former representative to USA Sri Lanka Fulbright Commission. Professor Mohan De Silva is a respected 
pancreatobiliary surgeon who pioneered and established endo endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatic surgical services ERCP and postgraduate hands-on endotherapy training programs in Sri Lanka from 1990s a service which is well established in the island today he also function as a chairman University Grand Commission of Sri Lanka from 2015 to 2019. The prestigious award of SAC Surgical Icon of Sri Lanka was conferred on Professor Mohandi Silva in December 2021 during the annual scientific conference on, of the Association of Surgeons of India after being nominated unanimously by the, by the Council of Surgeons of Sri Lanka and ratified by the Council of Sark Surgical Care Society. So over to you for your lecture. Thank you, Mr. President, for that kind introduction. President of the college, the Director General of Health Services of Sri Lanka, Dr. Asil Gunawadana, a guest of honor, WHO representative of Sri Lanka, Dr. Alika Singh, the keynote speaker at the Ghana Central Bank of Sri Lanka, Dr. Nandalal Virasinghe, the immediate past president, Dr. Arim S.K. Ratnayaka, the secretary to the Ministry of Health, Mr. Janaka Sri Chandragupta, Secretary of the Association, uh, Dr. Alan Pudwaik, members of the Council, respected past presidents, and other distinguished minorities, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. Years ago, when I was a surgeon in the University Surgical Unit at Colombo South Teaching Hospital, a new director was appointed to our hospital. Columbus South Teaching Hospital is a large hospital, although it's much smaller than our big national hospital. For long, this hospital was considered as a landing pad for consultants before they step into their end post at the General Hospital Colombo, as it was called then. And at that time, no one was that interested in developing this hospital because of the close proximity to this big, giant hospital. However, when LaSalle arrived, uh, the hospital was just entering into the pathway for progress. At this time, like any other big hospital, we had our fair share of issues. Within a few months, we began to see the presence of a big character within our new leader. We observed his science and art of approaching, interacting, handling and solving diverse and sometimes quite complex problems and situations. And I remember mentioning this to my colleagues that he has within him a leader who is on the ascend. Under his leadership, the hospital grew without any fanfare. And today it has become one of the most sought after service providers in certain specialities, enjoying an excellent caseload and case mix, an ideal setting for a quality teaching hospital, which is a reflection of the public trust the hospital has earned under his leadership. So we were very happy to see when he ascended to the pinnacle, the dream of any medical administrator, the coveted post, the Director General of Health Services, which he achieved on his academic and leadership credentials. Today he's inducted as the President of the College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka, and I'm very happy to be with him and with his family and with all of you on this historic occasion. When I read the theme your college has selected this year, strategic healthcare leadership, navigating through troubled waters, at once I felt I'm in the right place at the right time with the right people to speak to. What a galaxy of leaders we have here. We have on the stage the president of the College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka and the director general of Sri Lanka who's actually heading a ministry responsible for delivering free healthcare 
at a time when this island is declared as a poor income state, and in a country trying to recover from infamous COVID pandemic, we have the Secretary Ministry of Health, who is the Chief Accounting Officer, and two, we have the WHO representative of Sri Lanka, and we heard what she just said about Sri Lankan health system. And to cap it all, we have the governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, who is navigating our nation through these extremely turbulent waters with great difficulty, who is going to deliver the keynote address, which all of you are eagerly waiting for. And we have in the audience the present and the past high healthcare administrators of this nation. So what a setting. So I wish, in this short speech, to appraise you on a topic. Leaders, leadership, and strategic leadership to provide you all with an opportunity for self-reflection. The honest self-reflection opens your mind to reprogramming, change, success, and happiness, and the freedom, a famous quote, by Vickers Runwell, and I'm a serious believer of reflection. Of course, a lot has been spoken and written on this subject. There is a, obviously a difference between the leader, leadership, and the strategic leadership. At the outset, I wish to tell you that I'm referring here to professional leaderships and not political leaderships. There is there are well-recognized attributes of a good leader of a professional organization. In simple words, they are proactive people who believe and follow rules and guidelines. They are reactive people in the sense that they can handle unexpected adverse situations effectively. They are people who are deeply committed to their work and for the continuous growth of their organizations. They are visible in their collaborations with other relevant systems and with wider public when needed, whenever they are called upon to do so. Good leaders can motivate and direct those who work with them. There is this fine line between the decisive but not bossy or decisive but not controlling type of leader and the leadership they provide. Let me very briefly explain what the literature says about good leaders and also not so good leaders. Well, good leaders lead the team by providing the direction. They demonstrate high moral standards. They encourage ethical practices. They are considerate about the needs of the individual team members. They set and maintain high standards and support quality by adhering to principle. Good leaders, have good behaviors. They are humble personalities. They treat subordinates with kindness and respect. They clearly follow organizational protocols and by being an example so that they can request all their team members to observe high standards. In other words, they walk the talk. Poor leaders have poor behaviors. They often fail to observe standards. Sometimes they have arrogant attitudes. They not infrequently attend late for their meetings. They show sometimes disrespect to other participants. And often they don't allow others to participate in discussions proactively and disregard or dismiss opinions of others. But most importantly, they themselves are oblivious to all these attributes, which is actually visible to all around them. As a result, they lose the trust and the confidence of the organization and the wide society they serve. Good leaders suppose others always they provide cognitive and emotional help to all the team members irrespective of their status. They try to identify the individual abilities to get the best out of them. They of course provide constructive criticism to their team members but never in open forums always discreetly or privately. They generally to give credit to the tasks that are performed well and are conscious of not to get credit for the work of others. The leaders with the poor behaviors, of course, have the opposite. 
Good leaders cope well when under pressure and has the capability to be visible to their team as one who's in control of such a high pressure situations. Leaders with poor behaviors when faced under pressure often suppress their concern over the problem and demonstrate the so-called ostrich mentality. They are known for not delegating responsibility to the experts when technical challenge requires full attention and often blame everyone else for errors and does not take personal responsibility. Good leaders have good situational analysis and good situational awareness when under pressure. In such situations, they are capable of making precise and timely decisions and plan confident actions. As shown in the NASA technical report, effective leaders always ensure appropriate task management by organizing the task well to achieve their goals. But most importantly, they themselves join to perform the task and review the results with their team members. Ladies and gentlemen, a few weeks ago, world's richest person acquired one of the biggest tech companies in the Silicon Valley for a staggering sum of 44 billion US dollars. Within a few days, he decided to fire 3,700 of his employees in a major restructuring process, and I think therefore yesterday it has gone up to 4,000. That included some key personalities said, and this real life situation, as we call in medicine, a strategic decision making must be balanced with the loss of trust and confidence of the organization by the present and the future potential employees. When such high valued human resources are terminated by eliminating them from their company IT platform, just like that. So, the effectiveness of that type of strategic decision on a short and medium term of a mega organization is, in fact, a $44 billion worth question, and only time will tell. So successful leaders must show situational leadership, that is, awareness and the ability to balance the needs of a situation by assessing the particular task, by balancing the risks, benefits, opportunities, and threats. So strategic decision-making can be more complex than what it sounds. We saw that, actually. I saw that during the COVID pandemic, when unbelievable pressures were brought onto our highly recognized public health system of our country, of the Ministry of Health, a system with a proven track record, as evidenced by the excellent public health indices that have been produced by them over decades, one of the best healthcare indices in Asia, as just mentioned by our WHO representative but you handle it. Effective leaders have high emotional intelligence. Not only they know their own emotions and can manage their own emotions, but they also can recognize and understand others' emotions too. All effective, efficient, and successful leaders have one thing in abundance, and that is loads of common sense. They display leadership during an emergency by using what we call the helicopter view, that is, by rising above the crisis and see the big picture before they start acting. I'm sure our respected governor may touch upon this subject, how to provide effective economic situation leadership under pressure to a nation trying to rise amongst the greatest hardships which have, which have been unprecedented in our country. Ladies and gentlemen, in the field of, field of global medicine, in terms of such plans, the speed at which some emergencies present may be even much faster than the financial catastrophes which our central bank is facing today. Situational handling and providing strategic leadership under such pressures call for a totally different approach from our usual approach in clinical medicine. Let me explain this with a little more clarity. The traditional diagnostic approach, the careful history taking, followed by a thorough physical examination and the use of targeted investigations to confirm a diagnosis before a treatment is commenced is what we used to use for centuries in medicine. However, the rigid adherence to this methodology in an emergency situation may lead to disastrous delays 
in commencing treatment and therefore poor outcomes. As we all know, the worst outcome in the field of medicine is death. So I will tell you a story to prove this point before I conclude. When we were medical students, I'm sure all of you will agree with me, that we were not trained to treat, we were not trained to treat the critically injured patients. We use the same approach as treating a patient with abdominal pain. Advanced trauma life support system was not heard of then. As it happens, great leaps in the progress of mankind have come from unique people with resilience. The personal tragedy of Dr. James Steiner, an orthopedic surgeon practicing in Lincoln, USA, whose experience following an unexpected crash landing of his own light aircraft, carrying his family, wife, and four children, in a cornfield in rural Nebraska in 1976, in midwinter, changed the entire approach to trauma care in the world. A man of action instead of words, the chaos he observed during this initial treatment, his critically injured family received on that faithful day when he himself was badly injured, during which his beloved wife passed away in a rural health facility in the earliest hours of the morning. He felt that no one should ever undergo that experience he and his family underwent that night. What he proposed and propagated was nothing new. The greatness of his project was in its simplicity. By putting an order to the chaos of things that he observed during this event, he proposed to create a process to standardize the treatment in terms of priorities and sequences. This story, in my opinion, is very important to take cognizance of to any leader in any field, not only in medicine and trauma, but equally when handling grave financial tragedies. So what was this revolutionary proposal? In simple terms, it actually boils down to two things. First, the initial assessment and resuscitation must begin simultaneously. And the second is to recognize and attend to the most life-threatening injury first during the so-called golden hour of trauma. Actually, the Israelis now talk about golden minutes of trauma, not golden hour, to save life and to prevent disastrous damage to survivors. Ladies and gentlemen, for example, acute complete airway obstruction is the quickest killer of the injured, and if not attended, it will kill you in three minutes. That is the value of the golden minutes. The words primary survey and the secondary survey was coined and now have become keywords to enter what we now call the universal trauma language. In 1979, American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma adopted this project. It took time for this new system to arrive in our small island nation. As the, at the College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka, we were very happy and we deeply appreciated that the Ministry of Health recognized the importance of this and introduced the concept to Sri Lanka by establishing the first ever National Trauma Directorate. The College of Surgeons of Sri Lanka celebrated the successful conclusion of the 150th National Trauma Management Course in April this year. And this concept has saved thousands of lives in our country and millions across the world. So system change works even in worse situations, when there's a critical situational analysis and effectively and timely action as this story depicts. In summary, ladies and gentlemen, leadership and good management achieve, achieved by setting and maintaining standards, effective teamwork, supporting others, coping under pressure, having skills for diagnosing the situation and reaching a judgment in order to choose an appropriate course of action and weighing up the threats and benefits of potential options. Of course, clear decision-making abilities come with experience. Ladies and gentlemen, all of you all are leaders here.
but being a good leader is difficult. It's like being a famous goalkeeper. No matter how many goals you save, the people will always remember the goals you have missed. As a leader, one cannot always make good decisions. It is often said that the leadership of a professional organization is not for daydreamers. They must be doers. Always be aware of your surroundings. Always look forward and not backwards. Ladies and gentlemen, life is a game of chess. You cannot undo the moves. But you can make the next move always better. One must have a lot of resilience to be a good leader who accept the fact that the changes are bound to happen all the time and some may not to be to our likings. We must analyze how to resolve situations. We must not hesitate to obtain advice and must apply the safest and the most appropriate solution, which at times may not be the best solution. Don't feel bad if the people remember you only when they need you. Feel privileged that you are like a candle that comes to your, their mind when they are in darkness. In fact, we saw this happening in Sri Lanka when our country was in a dire financial crisis last year looking for help. And we saw the result. I'm talking about the professional help. Knowledge will give you power, but the character will give you the respect. Dear Sailor, in my opinion, you have been a successful leader because you possess most of the attributes, but more so because of your humility. However, remember one fact, and this is important to all of us, handling high pressure, high risk situations. Greatest wealth we will ever possess is our health, our health. It is not the material wealth. And in fact, this was very elegantly told by the grieving daughter of a Portuguese billionaire banker, the chairman of Spain's largest bank, Santander, when she said that we are a billionaire family, but my father died alone and suffocated, looking for something as simple as air. The money stayed at home. So we must learn the art of not taking pressures to our hearts, only to our brains. We must give our best to the humanity and enjoy the innate happiness from our contribution and your contribution to the healthcare needs of our nation and our people, which gives us, all of us, the longevity. The Asela, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for gracing this event as the chief guest. And I would like to invite the president of the college to present a token of appreciation to our chief guest. Ladies and gentlemen, next on the agenda is the address by the President of the College. We would now like to invite Dr. Asela Gunavardhana, the President of the College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka, for the Presidential Address. Good evening to all of you. Chief Guest, Professor Mohan De Silva, Emeritus Professor of Surgery. Guest of Honor, Dr. Alaka Singh, WHO Representative Sri Lanka. Keynote speaker today, Dr. Nandilal Virasingh, Governor of Central Bank of Sri Lanka. Outgoing President of College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka, Dr. Saman Ratnayaka. Secretary to the College, Dr. Alan Lodewijk. Past Presidents, Fellows of College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka, Council members, members of the College, Secretary to the Ministry of Health, 
former secretary Dr. Nihal Jayatilaka, Pro Professor Nalin Nabi, secretary dean management of uh, management faculty OUSA, president of other colleges, all the DDGs, all the directors of the Ministry of Health, all provincial directors, regional directors, directors of the institutions and emissions of the other hospital, hospitals, all the professors, consultants, all the SARS, registrars, medical officers, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor and privilege to address this prestigious gathering for the inauguration of scientific session and induction of President of College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka 2022. In fact, this induction was scheduled to be held last March due to the situation that prevailed in the country. It was postponed several times and we decided to combine it with annual scientific session. If I start with the history, in 1950s, this is Japan, this is uh, England, Germany, China, Switzerland, and Sri Lanka. These pictures represent the history of these countries 70 years back. And Sri Lanka was in par with these countries. But in the current context, we can witness the development of the other countries when we compare to the development of Sri Lanka. The slow progress in the development is due to multifactorial causes, and now we are facing the worst economic crisis in our history. This slide is the economic and health indicated selected countries. This it's a comparison of economic and health indicators of Sri Lanka in 1950s with other countries and the indicators in 2020 with the same countries. Although per capita health expenditure is 161 US dollars, which is low when comparing with the other countries, you can see in the uh, graph table, the health indices are in par with other developed countries. This shows the efficiency of low-cost healthcare model of Sri Lanka. And these pictures are very familiar to us when the COVID uh, struck our country. And the last one is the, when the economic crisis came. When the political and economic crisis hit Sri Lanka in January 2022, the public and private sector were already struggling due to an unfavorable investment climate, political instability, low business confidence, disruption of tourism, all of which led to a downfall of revenues. Business were barely recovering from the impact of COVID-19 pandemic including lockdowns, travel restrictions, and trade restrictions. The abrupt instability of the government disrupted the functioning of financial institution and threw the financial sector into crisis and largely cut off the flow of foreign exchange. This resulted in an economic shock which interrupted the delivery of basic services and further compromise the services of private and public sector. This directly affects the health sector also. We were experiencing disruption of supply chain management of pharmaceuticals and other supplies which are needed to run the health sector daily. During this most difficult period, our country's history as medical administrators, all of you are doing a yeoman service to run the health service as smoothly as possible. This is why we selected our theme of the scientific session as strategic healthcare leadership navigating through troubled waters. Challenges to 
expand the health services. Sri Lankan health expenditure, all of us know that it is 3.2% of our GDP. Health per capita is 161 US dollars. The government spending on public health sector is 1.6% per percent of the GDP. In spite, of, in spite of having low budgetary provision for the health sector, our health indices are in par with developed countries. This was achieved due to strong public health system and good curative care services. But due to the current economic crisis, Sri Lanka has been ranked again as a lower middle income country. A strained national budget, large borrowings, lack of external support led to increasing income irregularities and economic uncertainty. This affects all the sectors of country, including the health sector. Key areas to be looked at. There are 52 acts under the Director General of Health Service, which mainly focus on regulations. At the moment, we are using these acts to take legal actions. But these acts should be used to provide better health care services to the general public of Sri Lanka. For an example, if we take the Food Act, where the DGHS is the sole authority, we can utilize the act to improve the food safety and hygiene of this country rather than filing case against errant food dealers. Ensuring equitable and equal distribution and utilization of resources at the central government and the provincial level should be done based on evidence, not by influence, they are by serving needs rather than the wants. Financial allocation for vulnerable and marginalized population should be given priority. A public-private partnership mechanism should be explored to increase the utilization of our operating theaters, biomedical equipment utilization, laboratories, etc., which are idling after routine working hours. We should reconsider the appropriate pooling of resources and efficient purchasing of health-related items. Establishment of paying award system in tertiary and secondary care institution should be initiated with existing infrastructure, which is already in the 2023 budget proposals. Establishment of a separate emergency health fund under the central bank or the treasury, which is funded by either donations or directly from people's earning or by allocating small percentage from the taxes which are already exist. This should not be an extra burden to a public. This fund should be utilized only under the exceptional circumstances like foreign reserve falling below three months requirement of the country. Should consider establish a social in insurance scheme with state in involvement as uh, the WHO representative also mentioned Establishment of a system that enables to get portion of the income generated by the institutions for the development of the same. This is to provide more financial autonomy at provincial level, district level, and institution level to create ownership in income generation. Human resource management and deployment and technology assessment are two key areas to be revisited with new policies. I'm going to take a few examples on human resource uh, deployment. Uh, this is uh, the distribution of medical specialists by district. You can see uh, the number of medical specialists by district here. Most are in Colombo, Gampaha, Kandy. So the least uh, will be at Mena, uh, Mulatiu. And these are the distribution of national schools of Sri Lanka. So if you super superimpose these two, you can see the difference. So the consultants and the, uh, it very clearly shows they are rally around around the leading national schools.
this figure this figure clearly depicts the medical specialist distribution within the country we took the distribution of medical specialists versus national schools as an example considering the distribution of the specialists 708 are in colombo where the number of national schools is 37 the jaffna district there are 87 specialists where the seven national schools are there in mulati only 11 consultants three national schools batiklo there are 68 consultants with 13 national schools Medical specialist per 10,000 population in Colombo district is about 2.8. Jaffna it is about 1.9. Batiklo it is about 1.1. Monragala it is 0.8. This is uh, clearly shows the regional maldistribution of healthcare workforce despite the measures adopted by the Ministry of Health to retain employees in rural and difficult stations. This will be again aggravated with the new retirement uh, circular as well as the five-year no-pay leave circular. When the distribution of medical specialists was superimposed with the national school, it was an obvious fact that presence of national schools in a particular district has a positive effect in, on retention of medical specialists in the selected district. This phenomenon, phenomenon is common for all categories of healthcare staff this is to emphasize the need for improving associated socio-economic conditions in a district or a region to retain human resource in health sector in rural and difficult stations. If I come to technological assessment, I think most of the medical administrators here know what it's mean by technology assessment. This table, you can see uh, the number of uh, value of the equipments distributed among the provinces. So our biomedical inventory is amount to nearly one billion of US dollars worth. That is, we are having one billion of equipment within our country. This is US dollars. When you convert to the Sri Lankan rupees, it is nearly 370 billion rupees. So expenditure per person <laughs> in USD is the highest in the northern province, that is 80 USD per person, and the second highest in eastern province, and western province is 47. The least expenditure is at northwestern province, that is 24 USD. The norm, as a norm, 10% of this inventory has to be replaced each year. That is 36 billion rupees need for each year for the replacement only. This shows how capital investment of medical equipment bears on annual health budget. Our annual health budget for biomedical engineering units amount nearly two to three billion rupees. This reflects the limitation in cash flow to biomedical engineering unit, and this forces us to use this machine for 10 to 15 years, despite of new versions with advanced features being introduced to the world market. Using the old version will increase the maintenance cost and the repair cost year by year. This problem arose due to the lack of technology assessment when providing equipment to different level of medical institution. In future, we must develop a policy on technology assessment and determine the type of equipment according to the level of care. This is to prevent underutilization of exp expensive equipment and get the best return on investment. This is uh, one example I want to show you. Uh, there are, if you take hemodialysis machines, we have uh, 593 hemodialysis machine in this country. Our number of CKD patients are 178,253. Hemodiasis needy patients, that HD patients are nearly about 7,000. So, uh, according to the nephrologist, uh, the minimum recommendation is 3 HD per week. But according to the numbers, uh, the machines available and the machines we are utilizing, we are giving only 1.2 HD per week at the moment. So, when we analyze, either we'll have to increase the number of machines to give 
three HD per week, or to utilize these machines on a better way to uh, increase the number of HD per week. So the best way is we can use it is then without increase the number of machines is increase in the cycles per day. If you increase three cycles per day, at least you can give 1.78 HD per week. If you increase the four cycles per day, you can increase up to 2.3. So this shows without, uh, now we don't have capital budget in this year. So we'll have to utilize our own staff to increase the number of HDs, that means sessions per machine and give better service to the uh, patients. So uh, this is, uh, as administrators, this is really challenging, uh, but we can do it. So this is uh, one thing that we can uh, do as medical administrators. Technology assessment policy should be developed. Equipment distribution should be done according to the level of care, that is primary, secondary, tertiary, and national hospitals. Maximum utilization of equipment during their lifespan should be achieved. Most of our high-end equipment are idling after 4 p.m. Equipment will be replaced in 10 years or sometime with the arrival of new versions. Because of this, even without using 50% of their lifespan of the equipment, they will be replaced. For optimal utilization of high-end equipment, they should be open for private patients as well after working hours. For example, MRI, CT, DSA, which are very high-end equipments, can be made available for the private sector patients also. Digitalization of the inventory and the equipment management is a current need. Preparation of a department blueprint is a part of this exercise is underway right now. Now we have got a lot of uh, health informatics doctors who got uh, uh, consultants and there are other masters holders. I think we have to utilize them for this purpose. So enterprise architecture is, is it's not a new thing, but uh, we are not practicing it. It's a discipline for proactively and holistically leading enterprise responses to disruptive forces by identifying and analyzing the execution of change toward the desired business vision and outcome. This is a very uh, current need and we can use it. This will help us to strategically place human resources, equipment, other resources in order to achieve cost-effective management of health sector in a sustainable manner. However, we are expected to preserve the human touch where it is needed. The digitalization or automation should be done where the human touch is minimally needed. The enterprise architecture is a door opener for this process. The next one is uh, my pet subject, that is uh, care pathways and the clinical audit. Care pathways are based on evidence-based medical practice, bridges the gaps between the theory and practices. Currently, we are using only guidelines which are not practiced uniformly throughout the country. Care pathways should be introduced to improve the clinical quality patient safety and accountability of the service provider. Clinical audit, audits and care pathways are implemented to achieve better quality of care and better patient outcomes and satisfaction. On the other hand, it will improve the accountability of the service provider. We should make performance audit compulsory for each unit. Already few hospitals are volunteer to do this as a pilot project. We'll have to do it as a pilot project and see. And uh, I have spoken to few consultants in that hospitals also, and they are willing, so we will try to implement this uh, from next year. The next one is uh, the primary healthcare restructuring, reforms, and the transformation. Uh, 
I think uh, Dr. Alaka Singh uh, has elaborated on this matter. Compartmentalized service is seen in the healthcare system. Staff and resources are functioning in silos or vertically divided. Pooling of resources can be easily done for screening, treatment, prevention of communicable and non-communicable diseases. Implementation of proper referral system is a key factor which should be streamlined and practiced. This will reduce the overcrowding over utilization of resources at secondary and tertiary care institutions. This will give opportunity for patients who actually need secondary and tertiary care to get good quality service. First contact care should be improved at all levels of care. Geriatric care and the palliative care should be coupled with the primary care service to achieve low cost patient satisfied service. This will reduce the health care cost a reduction of polypharmacy, unnecessary investigation cost, and other expenses related to health care. Restructuring of primary care should be done in a phase-out manner. In summary, I would like to emphasize the key areas of my presentation. I know that there are a lot of areas to be spoken in when you take health sector, but I took only a few areas because the limiting factor is the time. I would like to emphasize the key areas of my presentation. First one is the establishment of sustainable health financing mechanisms. I think Dr. Ratnaik also elaborate. I can, we can hear from uh, the central bank governor how he is going to give us money uh, in, in coming years. Implementation of equitable and equal distribution of human resources. This is very important. When we go around the country, we see there is a uh, drastic uh, uh, disparity in human resource dis uh, distribution, even though ministry is trying their level best. Appropriate technological assessment and usage. I think uh, I have told the number of equipment, the worth of equipment Sri Lanka has over 1 billion US USD. So I think for next few years, other than the high-end equipments which are already old, 10, 15 years, others we have to stop by. Promotion of evidence-based clinical audit and performance audit. This is a must. We have talking this for the last few years, but we have not implemented because we'll have to implement this and audit or uh, the performance by each unit as uh, the other countries are doing. Primary health care restructuring, aiming at better patient-centered service delivery. The cornerstone is uh, all these economic, when the economic crisis hit, uh, the primary care restructuring and the primary care strengthening is a very important thing. If we have, I think even still we are running like this because of our uh, public health the sector, the, the strong public health sector and the, because of the strong curative health care sector. So there is ample room for increase in the primary health care uh, sector uh, with the World Bank and the ADB we are doing uh, as a project, but uh, we should improve it uh, to uh, get the other uh, institutions also into the, this project. So uh, that is uh, my uh, presentation and the acknowledgement. First of all, I, I would like to acknowledge uh, my country where I got the free education from grade one to up to the postgraduate level. And the people of this country who have uh, given their tax money for my education. And for my school, primary and secondary, and uh, in Badula Uva College and the Badula Central College and the teachers of the school and the, my university, the beautiful university of Peradeni and all the teachers uh, there. And the supervisors and the teachers in the health department who, who have given me the uh, guidance uh, during my, my career. And my colleagues who are in the university, some of are here right now, who are still giving uh, the uh, valuable criticism for me. 
and the colleagues in my health department who are contemporary colleagues with me and some of them already retired and some are still working and all the other colleagues also who are telling me the goods and bads of the, my decision making. And all the staff members who have worked with me from the uh, hospital that I begin my career, all the consultants, all the doctors, all the other staff members who have given all the support to me to achieve my uh, this post. Without them, I don't think I'll be able to come and sit here as the DJHS. And uh, the staff members of the uh, DGHS office right now. And the officer bearers of the council. I cannot forget the old council members who have given the maximum support to make this event a reality from the vice president, the president elect, and all the other past presidents and who are working in the uh, committees, they have given their fullest support. We had uh, discussion throughout about two, three months, so my thanks go for them also. And the young administrators who are here, people, the couple who are comparing and the, all these backdrops, everything has been done by them not by any IT people from outside. They are all our administrators, they have done so. I have to acknowledge their work, thank you very much. And last but least, not the least, my family members. My parents, father and mother, they are not here right now. And my sisters, three sisters and my in-laws and lastly my wife Sagarika and daughter and son who are tolerating me for the last 30 years and sacrificing their all the life for my professional career development. So thank you very much and have a pleasant day. Thank you, sir, for the most gracious presidential address. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now refresh ourselves with a beautiful cultural event performed by the medical students of the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. We invite the group before, to come before the audience.
What a spectacular performance. Hope you enjoyed. Ladies and gentlemen, we now move on to another very important occasion of today's proceedings, the opening of the annual scientific sessions 2022. It is our pleasure now to call upon Dr. Asel Gunawardena, the President of the College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka, for the inauguration speech. Over to you, sir. All the dignitaries of the head table and all the other uh, college members and all the other distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen. As the president of College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka, it is my greatest pleasure to welcome you all for the inauguration of 29th scientific sessions of the College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka in 2022. During this challenging period in time, we we'll live in an era of unprecedented and rapid transformation that impact healthcare transformation which subsequently challenge the status quo. The scientific sessions cover a vast er area of healthcare system development topics under the main theme of strategic healthcare leadership navigating through troubled waters. These sessions are expected to illustrate the challenges faced by the health system due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the economic crisis which followed. Challenges which eventually paved the way for implementation of strategies for restructuring the primary health care system in Sri Lanka. In order to be better equipped in future for the pandemic response and health changes related to it, whether they may be human of physical resource management and strategies to overcome a burden that compound on itself. Annual scientific sessions are a platform for presentation of free papers, poster presentation, discussion by both local and foreign experts on strategic and critical issues and how to overcome the challenges we are facing. This is what makes it relevant as the effective application of current knowledge results in practical implementation of best practices based on the best available evidence and data. 
All our health professionals and medical administrators from the entire country will participate in this event over the next few days. The academic activity will strengthen and improve the capabilities of all the leaders and thereby impact and improve the health service delivery system in Sri Lanka. We all know that health is priority and as it a right of the citizen. The government thus has a responsibility to make strong efforts to provide for its people a better quality life, ensure their well-being and enable unhindered access to preventive and treatment modalities. This is an endeavor that requires courage, determination, strong intention in order to make an investment that is in the best interest of all our people for a better future ahead. Strategic healthcare leadership is a key stone in this challenge which needs to be met head on with great skill and understanding, keeping in mind to bring about sustainable benefits for all. My wish is th that this 29th annual academic sessions and the deliberations present and the presentation will take us forward in this direction to provide the catalyst for the system change that is vitally needed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, next on the agenda is the keynote address. Today, we have an eminent personage as our keynote speaker. I would like to invite Dr. Asela Gunawardana, the president of the college, to introduce Dr. P. Nandalal Veerasinghe, governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka, our keynote speaker. Dr. P. Nandalal Veerasinghe holds a PhD and a master degree in economics from Australian National University and a BSc degree from the University of Kalania. Dr. Veera Singha served as an assistant governor from August 2009 to September 2012, as well as the chief economist, director of economic research from January 2007 to the August 2009 at the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. He was promoted as the deputy governor on 27th of September 2011, while he was serving as an alternate executive director for India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Bhutan at International Monetary Fund, and assumed office as a deputy governor of Central Bank on 1st of September 2012. Dr. Veera Singha also served as a visiting lecturer for master degree course economics at the University of Colombo, visiting research economics at the Seasand Centre, Malaysia, and visiting the research fellow at Australian National University. He also an advisory board member of Centre for Applied Macroeconomic Analysis, Crayford School of Public Policy, Australian National University. He has published several research papers in international and local journals, including Central Bank staff studies. Dr. Veera Singer retired from the Central Bank as a senior deputy governor in January 2021 and worked as an independent consultant for economic and financial matters for multilateral agencies and global investment firms prior to assume duties as the governor of the Central Bank in April 2021. 22. Dr. Nandalal Veera Singha is the 17th Governor of the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. So what do you for your address? Good evening, um, Chief Guest, Professor Mohandisilla and also uh, guest of honor, uh, Dr. Alaka Singh, uh, WHO representatives who are here, um, and obviously new president, uh, Dr. Asala Gunawardana, uh, former president, um, Dr. Atnayaka, 
and the distinguished members of uh, the head table and also uh, distinguished audience. In fact, uh, uh, I would first thank Dr. Asel Gunwardana for inviting me uh, to this, uh, you know, with uh, deliver a keynote address for a group of eminent personalities in the health sector. In fact, I was invited and even <clears throat> when I come here, I will realize how important the function uh, for the health sector. Uh, and obviously, uh, uh, when I, before I came here, I was a bit wondering why the Governor Central Bank has been invited to this, uh, this forum for the College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka. So now I realize, listening to all the speeches, <laughs> why I have been invited. And also, I think, uh, I, in fact, it's a good opportunity. Uh, and listening to very uh, eloquent speeches, I was quite impressed uh, to listen to Professor Mohan Silla's speech as a health professional, but talking about the leadership. It's a completely different area of expertise. I think I, I, I really appreciate and enjoy the speech. Uh, and as well as uh, other speeches from the health sector, the issues, problems, and the challenges, uh, strategies going forward, and also uh, how to kind of uh, navigate in troubled waters, obviously, in this kind of difficult situations. So uh, this is uh, something I think I, these days when I go to public forums, I would always uh, like to, uh, you know, just thinking about why the Governor Central Bank is invited for different, it's not something new. I think if you look at, if you, when I recall the session that I have been speaking in public last, say, within a couple of weeks, uh, say, construction industry invited me, exporters association invited me, the internet day also invited the Governor Central Bank, and sometimes uh, education sector, all the sectors are inviting Governor Central Bank to deliver speeches. So when I think about it, I was wondering um, whether it's only in Sri Lanka, in fact. The issue, I mean, you, I'm sure you all have studied abroad and have experienced uh, some other countries uh, when you study. And probably, I think you have never seen in any other country, even in our part of the world, like India, Bangladesh, Bhutan, and the UK, USA, West Australia, anywhere else, you hardly see the head of the monetary authority or governors of the central bank going out and talking about the health sector, the education sector, construction sector. And this is something uh, unique here. As so I thought, uh, uh, I try to understand it and try to, I think what I see is this uh, kind of a confusion among the public, the role of the central bank and the role of the government. This is why I'm trying to communicate that message and convey and make a public awareness. The clearly the mandate role of the central bank and role of the government, two different entities in any economy. So this is why I think uh, whenever I go, people think central bank is the place where you would allocate money for everything for the government. In fact, it is not the case. That, that This is why I want to um, basically, I, I know Secretary Health is here, the Chief Accounting Officer. I think he should be here to answer the question that all were raised here, not me. <laughs> so I, I'll tell you why. Uh, the, uh, because the confusion, I understandably, is because, you know, first, first let me tell you, um, in fact, when I, before I came here, I was wondering what, what I, should, I should be talking about. And I asked, because I'm not an expert on the health sector. Nothing I don't, nothing I know about the say, medical administration, administration in Sri Lanka. I'm not an expert, because that obviously Governor Central Bank can't be expert in this area. I asked my research team, and they prepared some talking points, so four or five pages. I thought, you know, no point of reading that boring stuff here. And just to talk, uh, what is the listening to this speeches, I, I, I thought it would be much more useful for us to explain you the role of the Central Bank and the role of government. And then I come back to my own views on the health sector. Obviously, I have my own views not as a governor central bank, but as an economist, and how I see the economy going forward, especially in this kind of difficult period. First of all, my first part, 
would be to understand uh, how central bank is involved in the public policy and also in terms of re allocating resources among the various say ministries and and various public institutions especially when it comes to health it's a public health system uh, the role of the key objective of the central bank not only the central bank of sri lanka any other central bank the what we call monetary authority is to basically maintain what we call price stability maintain low and sustainable inflation for any economy using monetary policy is the prime objective of the central bank that is the foremost only objective for all over the world for the central bank is to simply use the monetary policy and bring the inf maintain inflation at a low and stable level while we are doing so there are other responsibilities coming to the central bank is uh, maintaining inflation at say for example for 4 5% on a stable basis uh, means the it comes with the price stability is the how to basically determine the exchange rate for the country how to maintain responsible maintaining external resource for the country to prevent a balance of payment crisis or prevent what we call foreign exchange crisis is all our responsibility so if we now you are experiencing what we call balance of payment crisis this obviously our failure of ability central bank failure to ability to maintain sufficient foreign exchange reserves to meet all the foreign exchange all the imports that you need not only your sector for the whole country we are not been able to maintain sufficient resources to supply all the finance all the imports that we need for the whole country not only for the government for the whole country and also what you see now the inflation is running at 70% which means central bank has failed to achieve its key objective to maintain inflation at around 4 to 5% like we had maintained 12 years before 2021 that's again we have failed recently to maintain our key objective and in addition there's another second objective is to maintain financial system stability which means maintain a stable banking system and without having any banking collapse or crisis uh, to have a good financial system which means whatever your transactions uh, savings through intermediary process to make investments that is the kind of facilitation the role of the central bank is to regulate and supervise banks financial institutions so that we have a proper intermediary financial intermediary services so that people can uh, you know make their savings safely their savings are safe public deposits are safe and the money out of public deposits are used efficiently for investment purposes and lend uh, to people to borrow money and for that purpose we need to have a stable banking system and monetary policy also linked to that the role of the monetary policy to maintain inflation low levels we are the authority to determine the interest rates of the country that's the instrument that we had only instrument that we can use to curtail inflation is the interest rates uh, so this is why the country the central bank sets how much for your savings how much you should get in terms of interest rates compared to inflation and as a borrower how much they should paying in terms of interest rate that they have to pay and they borrow from the bank system compared to inflation so that interest is a tool to manage inflation here then why these people are asking central bank you know allocate money for the series i mean this is one confusion in 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 our case sri lanka we have a in addition to those two objectives we have what we call uh, agency function is only not many countries in the had earlier but even sri lanka now we still are having managing the government debt is agency function by the government by, for the government by the central bank that is the uh, one of the low functions is key objectives are there in addition we are doing some side business for the government to say when government you know running the government have their own revenues they have own expenditure when they as a deficit they need to raise financing so they go to the parliament get the say annual this is the amount that uh, for the government to run the next financial year the last yesterday budget was approved there is a borrowing limit say 
3 trillion rupees for the next uh, example. I can't remember the number exactly. 3 trillion tr rupees for the government for next financial year to run the government all operations. Then our responsibility, then parliament, after parliament approves that 3 trillion, 3 trillion rupees for the next year, we have to help the government to raise that 3 trillion rupees for the operations, the deficit, finance, to finance the deficit from external sources, from domestic sources, from the central bank financing, that is money printing, and or from the markets or from foreign sources. For the three sources, our responsibility is to raise money for the government and we give that money to Treasury, Ministry of Finance. Then Ministry of Finance allocates among various ministries. This is the reason I think whenever uh, the ministries wouldn't get sufficient financing from the Treasury, which means Ministry of Finance, then they think Central Bank has not allocated money. It's not the case. Our responsibility only to raise what the government, the finance minister tells us, we need 3 trillion rupees, 3 trillion rupees for next 12 months. We raise from somehow, from the, as I said, external, domestic co the, the printed, printed money by the government, if, if we can't raise, and we give that money to government, treasury. Then, how you get money, the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Health get, gets money, is that, you know, there's a, there's, it's a parliament, it's the public finance full authority. That's why you see the, this, this committee stage debate, when your minister comes to the parliament, it is the public finance, is money, all taxpayers' money. Taxpayers mean not only collection of taxes, borrowing is also taxpayers' money. Whatever government borrows, it's a future taxpayers' liability. If the current taxpayer, future taxpayer will have to pay that. So this borrowings plus revenue, how that is allocated among ministries is completely the authority of the parliament. That is by constitution, uh, 149 of the provisional constitution, final authority of allocating money through various uh, whatever the uh, ministries is the parliament. That's why you see the committee stage debate is looking at the various ministries, how much so for the defense, how much as for the health, how much for the health, education. Once that is approved, it's even doesn't come to us. We don't know one, one then our reason is to raise ho, whole amount of this money. We raise it and give it to Treasury. And depending on the Treasury's priorities, and they allocate to pay with salaries, wages, pensions first. If anything left, then they give it to other ministries. That's how it's basically operating. And also, this is, the, you know, there's a resource constraint, obviously. Government, whatever, whether they want money or not, big amounts, there's, there's a budget constraint, resource constraint. You know, I saw this health expenditure, education expenditure, all a lot of debate going on. Is this not sufficient? But, you know, that what we have to understand uh, is that there's always a constraint, what we can afford what we can spend because this solar either you like taxpayers pay or your next generation your children future taxpayers will pay whatever we whatever we borrow for the future taxpayers what they spend now is the current taxpayers like yours so that's the basic principle and this is why i think it's, it's important to understand is i think just to clear this thing the allocation of resources among the ministries is the responsibility of the Minister of Finance to the Cabinet, to the Parliament. Why then, why that is not getting? So people think, now if you look at the budget, Minister of Health probably has been allocated, say, 100 billion rupees for the next year. But what will happen at the end of the year, by before this period, after the end of the year, you, might, you will find also there's an allocation, but you have been given only 50% of that. Why that's the case? Because when they budget for the next year, they have a revenue estimate approved by the parliament, then borrow limit approved by the parliament, then expenditure allocation. That all 
the the realization of expenditure allocation or impress is a function of how much government can collect in terms of revenues, how much can, can government collect in terms of borrowings. If the borrowings and revenues are lower, then obviously other side expenditure will have to be lower. That's why you get your expenditure cut by the treasury, not by the central bank, but by the treasury. So that's where the secretary, chief accounting officer's ability, and if you have a strong chief accounting officer, he will fight with the secretary treasury and ask, give me my share, don't give to education, don't give to defense, give me my share first. So that is his responsibility. If you don't get money, please go after him. So, I mean, I thought he should be here to talk about it. This is one thing. So this is just to let you understand. But this is important because there's no public knowledge about these things. Even a lot of people think, you know, this is central bank. That's why I, I in a number of letters I'm getting as a government central bank, day-to-day -day basis, is asking several institution governments asking, we don't get this money, we don't get this money. I always write the letter back, please forward this letter to the treasury. That's all I do. I don't even respond to those things. And I think this is where I, I don't think, sorry, I don't have answer to a lot of issues that was raised here. But let me, I mean, strategic uh, kind of, a, I mean, obviously we are in a deep economic crisis. Uh, this is where I think it's important to think about the new strategies and how you basically, you know, navigate through these troubled waters as the, the theme of the seminar is quite important in this kind of situation. Uh, and when, he, when I look at, this is all comments about my, my knowledge as an economist and how I see this has been evolved over a period of time and my experience and observation that I have seen in some other countries and markets. Uh, if you think about Sri Lanka, obviously we always are boasting and are satisfied about the Sri Lankan health and education system. That's why we people like us, my, myself, as well as a lot of people like you, are coming through free education system and come to these positions and making contribution to the economy. And also, globally, some of the Sri Lankans are doing a lot of good work, even on a global uh, uh, basis in other countries' markets as well. So we have had a very good education system. We have had a very good health system. And remember WHO, uh, our representatives was talking about. In fact, uh, if you look at several years ago, we is something whenever we, wherever we go, even to the World Bank or ADB, the oldest example is that look at the Sri Lankan health system, look at the Sri Lankan education system. But how we have come to this situation, if you look at historically, when we were low-income country, we, be, we were having a lot of support and we're focusing on health and education. That's public health system, public education system. And as a result, the, when we were in low-income countries, we were getting a lot of concessional financing from, for example, World Bank, uh, the ADB, uh, even the WHO, when incomes are low-income countries, getting a lot of support. As I said, we have been basically investing a lot of that money in health and education. This, that's why we're seeing this very favorable, positive results in terms of our human resources up to now. But when you look at the countries, those are evolving over a period of time. And when you are coming, becoming from a low-income country to middle-income, the low-income, low-middle-income, high-income countries, or middle-income countries, then the systems will have to be changed. This can't sustain. This is where strategic thinking, system change is needed. Especially, this is crisis is a good opportunity for think about whether we can sustain the system going forward, or whether we need to think anew, then we need to have a change, new thinking, how we can protect the, the country's health system, either public or private, both. When the countries are moving to high income um, ladder, obviously the free health system will have to be revised. This is where the, the, the is, there's a lot of mention about the social safety net. 20, 30 years ago, social safety net is the whole population because a lot of people are low income. 
Everyone should be given free health. All learn should be given free education. But when it comes to situation, people are basically, certain people are moving to high income groups. And then larger number of people in the high income groups, I think it is not sustainable for any health system to have a kind of a free health, public health system for all in the country. This, is, this has not worked anywhere else in the world. At some point, either this has to be changed or this will, break, this will you know, completely break out and there will be a crisis. Uh, this is, if you look at health, health system uh, is not easy anywhere else because the, that needs a lot of resources. Even developed countries, even like, you know, you all know, UK, even the USA, those are not perfect. There are a lot of issues, a lot of lack of resources, very tight resources for, to maintain a public health system. This is where I think, going forward, uh, and this is why if even without any probably systematic change, as we have seen in Sri Lanka, there's a private health sector is basically having a increase in share now. Like even public education or private education also now gradually increases share. That's why it, it, the mention was that, you know, the out of, out of pocket is relatively high now compared to, say, 20, 30 years ago. That is because the resource constraint that government is having, public system is having, at some point, some of the people will have to exit from the system, from the public system to private system. You have to have a proper, it's not like what we are saying in this country today, because of the resource constraint, people are forced to compel to go out of the public system and use out of pocket and go to the private system. That is not the best way to have a transition. You have to have a systematic transition, transition from the public health system to a private health system for people who can afford it. If you do not make that change in a systematic manner, the system won't sustain. That I can tell you, maybe three years, four years, five years, ten years, at some point the system has been, it's better the system will change now than later. It's because the, you know, the system, the problem is that now we are having aging population. And with the crisis, we are having a lot more people falling into poverty. So the public system has a lot of pressure, a lot of demands for people who can afford the health services. Increasingly, number of people increasingly are now falling back to public health system, but resources are limited. This is where we need to have a, this is where I think we also see other system is to have, have a proper health insurance system. That's also, we have here and there health insurance, but it's not properly regulated. There's no properly regulated private uh, uh, the, the healthcare systems. It's, it's uh, demand driven business opportunities. People are doing that business. Even if you look at doctors, because of the demand, you have a private practice because there are a lot of people outside there willing to pay some money and get your services. It is not something that has been evolved in a system. It is a responding to the demand and responding to a resource constraint. But that system, it will go to that direction, but we have to have properly systematic change to go into that system. Without that, I think, uh, to me, public health system need that. So for example, you look at your, your own system. And this is some of the proposals are really good. At least use the available resources much more effectively and share with the private sector and have opportunity. And people who can afford, even through the public system or private system, they should be able to bear the at least part of the cost. And to manage this, that's where you have the, you have to have insurance system. Yeah, the patient has this this thing and you have insurance, not only for the patient, but also for the doctors, if you have proper regulated system uh, to uh, address the risk. Uh, with, I mean, this is where the future, I mean, in the short term, the proposals uh, Dr. Gunawardhan was present are, are really good. Those are new thinking. 
but that can sustain for several number of years. But if you, are, you, if you don't ask for a change of the system, that has to come from the industry, come from the professionals, then even your survival in the future, the public health professional, will be very, very difficult. Because you also want, as a qualified professional, you need a certain level of comfort and incomes and certain things. But this system in, in, the, in, the, in the taxpayer cannot afford 100% of that thing. Because that's why we are in the crisis. Now, the, why we are in the crisis? Because we, we, we cut, you know, our, our government has been spending revenue is, say, good times 15% of GDP, expenditure is 20%. Still, the asset deficit of 5%, that can, can be managed through borrowers. But when it comes to situation, uh, revenue is 10%, expenditure 20%, you have 10% of uh, deficit, then we, we start borrowing a lot of money and we ended up in a debt crisis. Now, we are in the bottom of the economic crisis. When we come out of this crisis, that is why, the, as a policy, government has basically, that's government, again, the policy of the, the fiscal policy. There's a need to raise a lot more taxes to support your own services. If you don't do that, then if you again go back and borrow money and spend on health system or whatever the public uh, expenditure, we won't be able to change the system. We will go back to the same old thing and we will continue to we'll have a crisis. Uh, first, the, uh, the, the fiscal and government uh, financing crisis. That will spill over to the foreign exchange crisis. And then we will be having this problem. Let me also share uh, the role of the, I mean, I'm, 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 I really recognize, appreciate the role of the health sector a public health system was very, still very strong. The testimony is that the COVID situation, all the countries had COVID, we also had our share, but our system responded positively to me, they have done very well, and you all have done very well. Public health system has been quite strong in response to that kind of crisis. And after that, unfortunately, we came at this economic crisis, which is much more deeper than the COVID crisis. This is uh, only few countries, I mean, all the countries have the COVID, but n not other countries went into this kind of crisis. We had this crisis, economic crisis, much deeper. Now, in this situation, I can tell you why the situation that you were having, for example, because of the balance of payment crisis we had starting from early this year, uh, and this is where I think, if you can remember, even COVID time, you didn't have that much issues. I can remember during the March, April, uh, I think you can remember health services, health professionals, how long you have been waiting in petrol queues, diesel queues, even a lot of, you know, kind of uh, issues at service stations, you know, people are objecting that, you know, doctors are coming out of the line. And even with you, all the, these things, people are not happy that you are coming. This is still, rather than providing the health services, you are waiting in the, this, all these queues. In fact, we try to provide at least give some priority from the, especially from the government and from our central banks that we are trying to allocate whatever essentials at that point is to, for you to be able to go and do your services at hospitals by at least giving petrol or diesel quota on a priority basis to health professionals. If we did not do that, there would be a, another bigger social crisis and you also wouldn't be able to do whatever you were do, doing in the past. That was the situation. But now we have been able to manage it a little bit and use, at least now you can go to work with limited skills, you can still do your job. But still, I know the, the, the resource constraint. Uh, I think the, uh, the, this is one of the responsibility, I should say, making available foreign exchange for the whole country. When we don't have resource, our priority, first to provide this petrol, diesel, or essentials so that you can go back to work. 
Once we fulfill that condition, next one we have been for the central bank. This is our responsibility is to allocate whatever available foreign exchange to priority priorities. So pharmaceuticals, health is one of the priorities that we have been always telling the banks. Whenever you have any foreign exchange, please allocate this money to pharmaceuticals and also health sector needs. But unfortunately, even though we allocate foreign exchange, there's another crisis coming from the Ministry of Finance for the social of public health, uh, public health services, where they are not getting sufficient rupees, whatever they spend even for pharmaceuticals and some of the services earlier, contractors and even, they are not getting money, rupees. There's a rupee crisis and dollar crisis, both. Rupee crisis was even worse, as I understand, from the health sector. That is because the, when you are not, ministers was not getting sufficient rupees to place orders for certain things in advance, then order process getting delayed. And then it's not like, you know, you go and import potato or rice, you can't, you know, place orders for pharmaceuticals and all things, you know, in that speed. So delay the process, even though if you get some money, it will delay further the supply chain issues. That is, I think, why, uh, how, I, how I see the current shortages and uh, the, uh, the resource constraint in terms of foreign exchange is not necessarily lack of foreign exchange, at least for essential services like yours. It is because of supply chain issues, as I understand, because I also involved in several discussions with the Minister of Health when they ask him for an exchange, we say, okay, we give him priority. But for them to spend for public health, you need to have rupees coming from the treasury to spend by that dollars or import uh, necessary government that is not available. Still, there's a uh, lack of, uh, this is where I think the, why government is trying to raise taxes, is to raise more money and spend that money, allocate that money, even from the next year or not, for health services. Until that time, I think this challenge will remain. But that's a short-term challenge. We, I'm sure we can overcome this short-term challenge and can stabilize the economy next year. But this is not the short-term issue. As I mentioned earlier, you need to think about to, how to change the system, how you can sustain the system, and protect your health services, both public and private, and how to have a more sustainable model that everyone can have services, but giving protection for people who need services at, at, at lower cost or free services and making people who can afford it to making them pay in some way. That's why I like the proposal that in this budget that you have a better utilization of government resources, having paying wards and utilizing whatever the idle uh, theaters, all these things. And even the, the profession like you should be able to, you know, even do some extra work during your off time, even using government facilities and be able to, uh, you know, uh, provide the services to people who are willing to pay. Unless you change this one into that kind of system, I think it would be a challenge going forward. This is my little knowledge that how I see the health sector as an economist point of view. But from the other issues, I think I'm sure I'm not in a position, unfortunately, to address other demands that Professor Dr. Gunwadhan was asking to. Hopefully, I think he can <laughs> help your sector how to provide financing, getting from the Minister of Finance. We will try our best to raise necessary financing, but this is a difficult time. But I think hopefully next year, I think I am very hopeful that situation will be stabilized. But that's a short-term solution. But we need to, you yourself will have to come out and strategically think about how you can sustain this sector on a medium to long-term basis. Let me stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for that very timely and insightful keynote address. I would like to invite the president of the college to present a token of appreciation to our keynote speaker.
Ladies and gentlemen, professional excellence is something that we all strive for. But then there are the exceptional few whose dedicated contributions and outstanding individual service have led to significant advances in their chosen fields and the medical profession in general. The fellowship of the college is awarded to such august personages in recognition of a lifetime of commitment and distinguished service to the college and in the field of medical administration. The president and the council of the college are honored to award fellowships in this year to the following personages. Dr. R. M. S. K. Ratnayaka. Dr. Bhavani Devi Pasupati Raja. Dr. Mohammad Sultan Ibralebe. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Alan Ludwig, secretary of the college, to read out the citation for Dr. R.M. S.K. Ratnayaka. I have the privilege of reading the citation of Dr. Ratnayaka Mudian Silage Saman Kusum Siri Ratnayaka. He is the additional secretary, production, supply, and regulation of pharmaceuticals of the Ministry of Health. He graduated with a Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery degree from the University of Peradeniya in April 1994. He obtained his Master of Science in Medical Administration from the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, the University of Colombo, in February 2005. Currently, he is serving as the additional secretary of production, supply, and regulation of pharmaceuticals in the Ministry of Health since the 1st of October 2022. Before this, he was the Secretary to the State Ministry of Production, Supply and Regulation of Pharmaceuticals. He started his medical administration career as the District Medical Officer of Chilao Hospital and obtained vast experience in the medical administration field as the Deputy Director General Education Training and Research, Director of the National Hospital Kandy, Provisional Director of Health Services Northwestern Province and Regional Director of Health Services Putlan. He has many key achievements. He led the office of the RDHS Putlam to win the second best health management unit in Sri Lanka and provincial director of health services, Northwestern province to win a special commendation at the national productive awards of 2007 and eight respectively. He led the office of the, P, uh, the, pub, uh, the provincial director of health services to win the gold medal under the management unit category at the National Health Excellence Awards of 2009 and 2010. While RDHS Putlam, he engaged the community and private sector to build the MOH in Kalpitiya and uh, Kuruvela Gaswava and the administrative building of the Anamadua Hospital and the um, Mandulama, um, Mandulama Hospital building. Under his purview, the COVID-19 information management system of the Ministry of Health, Supariksha was developed and implemented in 2021. He successfully developed, piloted and implemented Sri Lanka's first drug store and pharmaceutical management system in the Northwestern province in 2010. He also implemented a fully digitalized PACS-based radiology system at the National Hospital Kandy. In the Northwestern province, he strengthened the thalassemia prevention program laboratories in healthcare institutions for NCD prevention and introduced physical exercise promotion for government staff, cost accounting in healthcare institutions, a real-time biosurveillance system. In the Putlam district, he led UNICEF and World Vision funded projects which upgraded maternal and child health services and strengthened primary health care services. At the National Hospital Kandy, he developed and implemented a national diet management system for the first time in Sri Lanka, implemented a fully electrical patient transport system inside the hospital, and established a centralized ambulance and hospital vehicle management system, deployed digital health technology by integrating automated appointment, queue management, and health information management system, systems into clinics, drug stores, and pharmacies. He implemented a process management project with, with, reduce, with reduced turnaround time for patients in clinics and the OPD. 
Dr. Ratnayaka was chairman of the steering committee of a JICA project for the improvement of basic social services targeting emerging regions and established the Dr. Tilak Abesekara Kidney Disease Treatment and Concessionary Center for hemodialysis of chronic kidney disease patients and a CKD screening project. He was instrumental in developing the hospitals at Dambadenia, Galgamua, Chilau, Anamadua, and, and Udapur. He attended many WHO conferences and workshops, and his research work was published in many internationally recognized journals. Dr. Ratnayaka is a visionary and strategic leader who is an expert at continually refining and advancing an organization. He is a versatile, highly adaptable professional and key problem solver with a proven track record as a leader for nonprofits and has a reputation for setting high expectation, promotes institutional goal attainment, and applies expertise to key aspects of executing institutional mission. Mr. President, it's my privilege and pleasure to present to you Dr. Ratnayaka Mudyansala Ge Saman Kusumsiri Ratnayaka to receive the award of fellowship of this prestigious College of Med Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka. President of the college will now present the fellowship scroll to Dr. R. M. S. K. Ratnayaka. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to invite Dr. Samindi Samrakon, council member, to read out the citation for Dr. Bhavani Devi Pasupati Raja. Dr. Mrs. Bhavani Pasupati Raja. Dr. Mrs. P. Pasupati Raj is a medical administrator in the Ministry of Health since 2005. She enrolled as a medical student in the second batch of Faculty of Medicine, University of Jaffna, and obtained her MBBS in 1984. She was the district medical officer at Base Hospital Manor for 10 years and given leadership to her institute to deliver health care to people of Manor at time of the ethnic crisis. During her tenure, she managed to perform her duties. Even the supplies were cut off from the other part of the island when only transport medium was through naval operation. Then she got opportunity to deliver her services to the people of Vaunia, where she cared for her patients during war period as the district medical officer to the base hospital Vaunia. She has performed her duties as the medical officer of Colombo Municipal Council for about two years. She obtained her diploma in family medicine in 1999 and the Master of Science in Medical Administration in the year 2004. From the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, University of Colombo, after completion of the master's degree, she was appointed as the medical superintendent at the District General Hospital, Baunia in year 2005 and performed her duties as the institutional head successfully during the war period and post-war period up to year 2010. This period was most challenging as she had to manage war casualties and had to cater to her health care needs of the internally displaced persons. Under her leadership, the hospital continued to serve as an apex hospital to a significant number of people who were displaced from Kilinochi and Mulati. In some occasions, she had to face life-threatening situations during this period. Despite many challenges, she was able to fulfill the healthcare needs of people utilizing scarce resources efficiently. Her professional skills and experience helped to manage the situation and saved large number of innocent people with the cooperation of government officials and the healthcare employees who were appointed to Aunia from different parts of the country. 
As, government, as a government servant, she safeguarded the dignity of the country by giving fullest support to deliver health care needs of the public. Her services were appreciated by many officials during the difficult period. Thereafter, she performed her duties as the director of teaching hospital Jaffna for five years and as the RDHS Vaunia until her retirement in 2020. It's noteworthy to mention that from the beginning of her career, she has spent majority of her lifetime savings serving the people in the northern province during the most challenging period of that region. She rendered her service to the general public as a full-time government servant despite many personal commitments. Now, she's, ble she's blessed with the daughter who is working as a medical officer at the Batiklo Teaching Hospital and son-in-law who is a medical officer attached to the LRH Colombo. Currently, she's enjoying her life with the grandson at her hometown, Batiklo. Mr. President, I am extremely pleased to present to you Dr. Mrs. Uh, Bhavani Pasupati Raj to receive the award of fellowship of this prestigious College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka. The president of the college will now present the fellowship scroll to Dr. Bhavani Devi Pasupati Raja. Thank you, sir. Now I would like to invite Dr. Priyanta Atapattu, council member, to read out the citation for Dr. Mohammed Sultan Ibrahim Bey. Good evening. Dr. Mohammed Sultan Ibrahim Bey is a product of National School Samanturi. He entered the Faculty of Medicine, University of Jaffna in 1980, and he was transferred to University of Peradeniya in 1985 due to complex situation in Jaffna. He obtained his MBBS from University of Peradeniya in 1986, an internship at Jawaharlalpura General Hospital. He commenced his career as a medical officer at Cancer Institute Maharagama in 1987, and then District Medical Officer, District Hospital Samanture in 1989, then Divisional Director of Health Services Samanture in 1994. He was selected to follow Master Science in Community Medicine at Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, University of Colombo in 1995. He was Regional Epidemiologist Ampara in 1996, and Medical Officer of Maternal and Child Health in 1999. Deputy, then Deputy Director, Deputy Provincial Director of Health Services in Ampara in 2002. Medical Superintendent of Astrof Memorial Hospital Kalmuni in 2003 and Base Hospital Gampolin later, later part of 2003. He was Regional Director of Health Services Kalmuni in 2009. During his tenure as a Regional Director of Health Services Kalmuni, he was able to bring the regional statistics to a top level in comparison to other districts in the province and was able to eliminate malaria situation in the region. He was honored by Provincial Ministry of Health for the same. In recognition of his exceptional contribution in curricular, religious and social services, thus building peace and harmony among all community recognized by awarding Samasiri Deshamanya by Honorable W.D.J. Seniviratna, Minister of Public Administration and Home Affairs of Government of Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka in 2010 on behalf of United Organization of All Communities. He was Director of Teaching Hospital Baticolo in the year 2014. His contribution to establish the state of art accident and emergency care unit of teaching hospital Batikolo, constructed combinedly by Ministry of Health Sri Lanka and the foundation support a national trauma service in Sri Lanka, Melbourne, Australia. In appreciation of his 
contribution to this project, the foundation supporting a national trauma service in Sri Lanka has invited him to Melbourne, Australia, and he was honored at the annual general meeting in 2017. He has published a number of books for benefits of staff and public, including sharing experiences and good practices on mental health in the regional director of health service area Kalmuni, named as Kalmuni model. A gu guidelines for private pharmacy owners, protocol for referral system in English, Tamil and Sinhala, guideline for food handlers and tam in Tamil, resource mapping of teaching hospital Baticolo in 2015, performance of teaching hospital Baticolo 2017. He retired from the service in 2018. He is a member of College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka since 2002. Mr. President, I am extremely pleased to present to you Dr. Mohammed Sultan Ibra Lebbe to receive the award of fellowship of this prestigious College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka. President of the college will now present the fellowship scroll to Dr. Mohammed Sultan Ibra Lebbe. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, now we will move on to a special occasion, awarding of academic excellence in medical administration. These certificates will be presented to those who excelled in postgraduate courses of MSc and MD in medical administration conducted by the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine of the University of Colombo. I would like to invite our chief guest, Professor Mohan De Silva, Emeritus Professor of Surgery, to present the certificates. Also, I call upon the president of the college to accompany. Master of Science, Medical Administration, Examination 2022. Dr. Udilamatta Gamage Gihan Chaminder. Doctor of Medicine, Medical Administration, Examination 2021. Doctor Udugal Motige Gauri Sanketa Francis. Thank you, sirs. We now invite our energetic honorary secretary, Dr. Ellen Ludwig, to propose the vote of thanks. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Finally, we are at the end. Um, Stephen King so wisely said, don't let the sun go down without saying thank you to someone and without admitting to yourself that absolutely no one gets this far alone. And in the words of Cicero, the Roman philosopher and statesman, gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all others. It is therefore my privilege to deliver the word of thanks at this event on behalf of the College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka, the President and the Council, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed guests for gracing this occasion. Professor Mohan De Silva, Emeritus Professor of Surgery, our chief guest. And then our guest of honor, Dr. Alaka Singh, the WHO country representative to Sri Lanka. And our keynote speaker, Dr. Nandalal Virasinghe, Governor of the Central Bank. Sirs, Madam, your clear, your clear and thought-provoking messages have truly inspired and motivated us. 
Our gratitude to the, also goes to the President, Dr. Asile Gunawadhan, the past presidents and the council members of the college for your guidance and support in no small measure in helping organize this annual event and steering the college during these challenging times. Our sincere thanks to all the members of the committees and the subcommittees for their untiring efforts in handling all the arrangements for this event and the scientific sessions which will follow in the next two days. To all the sponsors, platinum, gold, silver, who came forward to support this event despite the challenging times that we are all facing, our deep appreciation and gratitude for your assistance to the college is not forgotten. To our uh, compeers this evening, our other postgraduate trainees, we sincerely appreciate your efforts, your commitment in support of the college. The future in time will be in your hands and you will look back in, on this experience, hopefully, with happy memories. And also a big thank you to the uh, students the, of, of the dance troupe from the Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. My thanks to all of you who have joined us this evening and taken the time to make this a memorable occasion. The President and Council cordially invites you to the reception that follows and wishes you a pleasant and enjoyable evening. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now invite you to enjoy another beautiful performance by our talented medical students. We invite them for the performance.
an absolute stunning performance. Thank you very much to the dance team. Hope you all enjoyed. Ladies and gentlemen, with that, we conclude the inauguration ceremony of the 29th Annual Scientific Sessions of the College of Medical Administrators of Sri Lanka. While thanking you for your kind attention and gracious presence, we kindly request you to stand for the ceremonial procession till they leave the hall. We would like to invite everyone for fellowship and cocktails. Have a pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you.